Hey there, welcome to episode four of the Active Bariatric Nutrition Podcast. I'm your host, Kim Tirapelli. And today I'm so excited to be sitting down with Dr. Sarah Anderson, a physical therapist in Central California, who has spent her career helping people enhance their lives through optimizing movement. Over the last 20 years, she has practiced in an orthopedic physical therapy clinic, working with athletes, injured workers, geriatric and pediatric patients, with a background in rehabilitation, injury prevention, and sports performance, Dr. Anderson can effectively work with people in all phases of their movement journey. During the pandemic, Dr. Anderson opened her private mobile clinic, Continuum Physical Therapy and Wellness, which provides personalized one-to-one treatment in an effective and efficient manner to help people get better faster. Sarah is a fitness enthusiast and is an avid runner, having qualified and participated in the Boston Marathon and most recently took first place overall in our local 10K race. And when I say recent, I mean like three days ago. That's amazing. Hey, Sarah, thanks so much for coming on today. Thanks, Kim. I'm excited to be here joining you on your podcast. Yeah, I'm so excited. You're my first guest too. So we should have like a celebration because you're my first official yeah. guest on the podcast. So thanks so much. So I feel tell like her. We've already been podcasting oh. for years, actually, just informally. Totally. I think I think our time spent on texting and hey, by the way, my kid hurt their arm. Can you help me? Or I just pulled my hamstring. Can you help me? Has uh we've had a lot of podcast episodes for yes. sure. So tell our audience a little bit more about yourself and your background as a physical therapist and your journey to how you got to where you are today. Uh, I think like many physical therapists, I was an athlete growing up and um, movement and sports was definitely something I found joy in. And then as I got injured myself, I um, had shin splints and Oshkosh slaughters, nothing, not a big injury, but I saw that there was a career that you could do that um, had a science and an art to helping people continue to stay active. And because that really movement and um, sports um, and the human body, I had a huge interest in the human body. My mom was a nurse. Um, I realized, wow, I can actually study this and help people um, in their movement journeys throughout their life. And that's something I found a passion in. So I can't believe that I've been in the clinic for 20 years now. Um, I started as an aide in undergraduate and then in graduate school continued as an aide in the clinic. Um, and so that's just kind of been my journey. And then throughout my professional career, um, I've gone on to earn my doctorate in physical therapy. It was a master's when we did it. Um, now it's uh, across the board, a doctorate in the United States. Um, and then uh, got my certified strength and conditioning specialist through the NSCA and functional movement system certified um, and uh, also uh, ergonomic certified for workers in the workplace. Mm-hmm. Awesome. And how did you get into running? Because I know you've been doing a lot of running. Yes, the running. Um, okay, so this is a secret just to your audience. First time saying this out loud in public. So I actually don't like to run, oh. um, but um, run. I but I do like to run. So running, I've used actually over my adult life as a tool to still be um, athletic, participating in local events. Because you know, as adults, we can't just go out and play basketball or play volleyball. You have to grab people and get that organized. But running was something I found like, oh, this is something we can do and still be athletic and active. Um, And because it's an accessible tool, it's something that we can just put our shoes on and go do. Um, I've used that over the years as I've had babies, as far as like postpartum, trying to get my body back. Um, And I also, the thing I really love about running, and I think many of your community will, and I think you as well, is that it's objective. Um, there's a time, you know how you did, um, you know how you did for that day and you can hold yourself accountable. Mm -hmm. And can I just, I just want to comment too, that you just returned from a trip over to Spain and Portugal and you did the Camino de Santiago. Is that what it's called? Tell tell us a little about that because that's so cool. So, um, so I just had a big birthday and uh, one way I wanted to spend my birthday was active. Again, it's part of my value system. I, I love movement. I love the outdoors. Um, and the Camino de Santiago is where you just walk from town to town. It's a it's a Catholic pilgrimage, but people of all walk of, walks of life do it. Thousands of people do it per year. There's many different roads, and maybe we can podcast on that a different time if your audience wants to know more specifics about it. But we only did six days, and in that six days, we did about 90 miles. Um, and if you do the last 100 kilometers and you make it to the cathedral, you get a, a special certificate that you did it. Um, 
So that's a great way to just be active and outdoors and, and participate in something as a community too, because you do meet a lot of other pilgrims, very similar to running. Running has a great community as well. For sure. I love it. Yeah, I definitely would want to do another podcast episode on that because I think yeah. just the fact that really anybody can do that because you're going at your own pace, your own speed. Absolutely. Right? You tra- you kind of just have set miles that you're trying mm-hmm. to do each day and you complete it as you do it, right? Yeah. We passed um, many people, retirees, um, a couple uh, that was 80 years old, both of them. And so as we were hurting and feeling tired, that was really inspiring. They were 80. So yeah. Wow. That's awesome. Cool. Well, today I wanted to talk a little bit about exercise guidelines for bariatric athletes um, who are beginning their exercise program, or even like a lot of my clients that are, you know, a little bit farther out from when they had their surgery and they're like, Hey, now I want to start, you know, training for maybe like a half or a full marathon or just mm-hmm. maybe even a 10K. Or a lot of my clients will say, hey, I just really want to start building some muscle mass. Mm-hmm. And obviously in those first four to six weeks after the surgery where they're mostly limited to you know walking, I wanted to kind of get today started with asking you, what are some you know movement goals that my, you know, our bariatric clients can think about, you know, in that early post-op phase? What would you recommend? Yeah, the the clients that you're serving, the bariatric patients, they're undergoing a a big surgery, you know, an elective surgery. Um, And I I would just say that's no different than the patients that I see in the clinic with like a total knee patient, a spinal fusion patient. It's a big surgery. It's altering for sure. Um, In the first one to two weeks, I always tell people just give your body and give yourself some grace. Um, There's going to be some hiccups. There's going to be things you didn't expect. Um, as, and prepare ahead of time, actually, to prepare your support system, um, prepare. Um, I know you're, you will speak more specifically on what uh, people would need to eat in that time, but preparing your, your bed, maybe it needs to be downstairs. Um, mm-hmm. But in the first one to two weeks, give yourself some grace, allow your body to just rest and heal. Um, and as you start to feel better each day, kind of check in with your, yourself and allow for some slower progression. Um And I would say also just kind of going towards our basic needs in those first one to two weeks, which would be like physical, intellectual, and emotional needs. So like the physical could be, what are your food needs? And obviously that's what you and the post-operative instructions would be more specific with your clients. Um, Like what are the first, with the food needs in the first one to two weeks for your population? Yeah. So generally after they have surgery, depending upon the surgical center, they'll have clear liquid phase and Mm -hmm. go to full liquids usually within the first week or two. And then they're on that for about two weeks of full liquids, usually protein drinks. And then they move into like a pureed or a soft diet phase, depending upon the surgical center. So yeah, the first couple of weeks, it's, it's just... I just had surgery. I just am trying mm-hmm. to get these fluids in. Absolutely. I'm, you know, I feel I have this new stomach. It's telling me different things yeah. and it's challenging in those first very several weeks. Very challenging. You know, and, yeah. it, and even if we compare that to like a total knee patient, it's very challenging because they're on pain meds. Pain is really usually what's limiting them. That, that might not be what's limiting your po- the bariatric population, but um theirs might be that they're just trying to figure out how to eat. And then the the total knee patient is oftentimes they, the pain meds creates constipation. So there is a food issue there too. So going back to those basic needs, just trying to figure out your food, definitely in in keeping your water intake up because sometimes you just don't feel like eating or drinking. So being conscious of that, Mm -hmm. Um, even if we remember back to our postpartum days, remember they discharged us with the big cup with the, um, with the numbers on it so that we knew if we drank enough. So just doing something to hold yourself accountable for water intake, um, making sure you get your sleep in, um, and then, uh, easy movement. So getting up every hour and pumping those ankles when you are sitting, just making sure you're getting some blood flow through your calves and your legs. Um, and then, uh, sunlight. Oh my goodness. I always promote sunlight, especially if you have it, if it's the time of year where you have sunlight is just getting outside. There's so much to be said about, um, pain and depression and just bluesiness after surgery is just getting outside can be so helpful. Um, and then, um, also this is an interesting one that I actually talk to my patients about is connecting with somebody outside of your house each day. I think that's some, a way we can meet our emotional needs, even if it's just a text or an email to an old friend, Hey, I just had surgery. Um, and keeping connected with your community. Um, And then the self-talk, the positive reinforcement to self, because I think the first one to two weeks after a big surgery, there's a lot of, what did I do? I shouldn't have done this. This feels horrible. Trying to keep those thoughts out and knowing that it is a longer journey than those first one to two weeks. Um, 
and talking to having support group of maybe other people that are on the other side of it. Um, with total knee replacements, luckily they were usually within therapy in those days and the therapist is encouraging them like, no, this is going to be good. This is just the right. hard part. But your patients too, they might undergo a period where they feel like, oh, this feels awful. But trying to keep the those thoughts out and knowing that this is a longer journey. Um, and I often usually encourage journaling. Um, like so with the journaling with somebody that's had a big injury, this might be my, like my, my car accident patients that have had a big injury. Maybe they've had a femur fracture, multiple fractures is it's, I know it's going to be a long journey. So if they can just journal a little bit each day, then they can look back and say, Oh, I am improving. Um, so and they might be, pick what they want to put in there. Maybe like, Hey, today I didn't sleep great. I didn't, I felt this way and I walked 2000 steps. Yeah. Um, and then they can look back two weeks from now and go, wow, now I'm walking 4,000 steps. And it's just a way to continue to encourage yourself in an objective way. No, I totally love that. And I, I wanted to comment too, that it is very, you know, it's not uncommon to have, um, you know, a bariatric client say, you know, after the surgery, I kind of thought, oh gosh, what did I do? Mm -hmm. You know, especially in those initial first few weeks where there can be some pain, they're, they're mm -hmm. working out the gas that they have from the surgery. They get constipated because of not only the pain meds, but also they've been doing a, generally speaking, a high protein diet mm -hmm. up into the surgery. Um, they, they, you know, might be getting, resuming their supplements that include iron. Um, and it's just kind of like this perfect storm and, and we kind of go, oh gosh, what did I do? And I think if we can get through kind of the other side, so to speak, through those initial first through couple of weeks where also we're just on the liquids primarily, it's it's a tough first mm -hmm. you know month or so. And I think exercise is so helpful because like you said, it's so helpful to just get out into the sun, communicate and mm -hmm. kind of interact yeah. with other people, move your body. Um, yeah. There's so much to be said about that that really helps with that healing besides mm -hmm. just we got to get our protein in and, yeah. you know, take our vitamins and that kind of thing. And I would say just remembering, like, remember our postpartum days after we yep. had babies, like this is not unlike any of these journeys where something big has happened to your body. Um, it's the same thing we did in those days. If we sat in the house for two or three days, we were going to be depressed and bluesy. Yep. And all of a sudden we're like, oh my gosh, I haven't been out of the house in a few days. And that's why even our postpartum patients, we encourage them, put the baby in the stroller and walk outside every day. Yep. Um, and so the bariatric clients, the same thing. It's a big change to your body. Just make sure in those first couple couple weeks, you just do the basics for your body and do it every day. And yeah. it's not fancy. It's just simple, but it's important. Yeah. And would you say, would you say like, you know, is there any kind of stretching or things that they can start kind of doing in those initial first few weeks just to kind of gently be moving their body? Obviously nothing that's going to strain their surgical incisions, but just some, you know, gentle movement. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, if they could get up every hour, that's important just mm -hmm. to get some weight bearing through their joints and get the muscles pumping. Um, even just a five minute walk around the house or just outside to the end of the driveway and back again, getting that sunlight. And even if it's not sunlight, maybe it's cold, but not slippery, right. getting a different environment on their skin. And um, there's research you could look at on just different ways that the eye, eye um, sunlight and things through the eye react with your, your body and your limbic system. Um, so so getting outside into natural light. Um, and then as you're sitting there, just being a little bit fidgety. So like um, getting your ankles moving. So mm -hmm. pumping the ankle like this, it helps with blood flow through the calf and through the feet. It helps with edema control. And your population is going to be losing a lot of fluid. So kind of just getting the fluid moving around the body. Yep. Um and then as you're sitting there, you can even just do some isometrics in the chair or standing. Um, and so isometrics are a contraction of the muscle without moving it through the joint. So just sort of squeezing the muscle. A good, okay. good muscles to do isometrics on are like your quadriceps, the one around your knee. And that would just be kind of like pushing your knee down, tightening your thighs, um, tightening your butt, kind of just mm -hmm. really pinching that bottom together just to keep those muscles engaged, um, keep the neuromotor connection engaged. Um, and it really kind of helps with pain control too, because you're engaging the muscles in a different way than just sitting. Yeah, no, I love that. That's awesome. And and once they're kind of through that early post-op phase, uh, what would you begin to focus on for their exercise? So for example, okay, we got through that first four to six weeks where, you know, the doctors have said, okay, you've been doing your walking, you've been, you know, aiming to increase your steps, you, you know, basically are feeling a little bit better. We're starting mm -hmm. to increase our protein a little bit more. Um, what kind of, uh, would, what would you start with in that first, you know, after that first month or so? 
Yeah. So after the first, if I could back up a little bit after the first two weeks, you know, if we're just talking about getting up every hour, then maybe the week two to four, then you go, okay, I'm feeling pretty good. Um, I'm regulated. Um, I, this doesn't feel like, what am I doing anymore? I'm, I'm getting more confidence. Then I would say after lunch and dinner, maybe increase your steps at those times is get outside and try instead of the five minutes every hour. Now you're looking at maybe 15, 20 minutes, depending on how you feel mm-hmm. and stay close to the house. Usually I'll tell people like kind of do laps in front of the house in case you do start to like, Oh, now I'm feeling pretty fatigued. Then as you get confidence with that, okay, now I know I can extend those laps and I can go down around the corner and back. Um, And some people won't need to go that regimented and they just feel good. But some people that are really trying to push themselves but are worried or have had some setbacks, it's better to just be safer than than sorry. Um, And so after meals, I like after lunch and after dinner, just because it's regimented, it's something you could remember. So that would be like from week two to four is increase your steps. Mm -hmm. Um, And then increase, um, you could, if you're feeling pretty good, you could even do some body weight type exercises that incorporate a little bit of balance. Um, and we can talk about balance as well, but at the counter, I like people standing at the counter and just doing some marching, lifting your knees up, um, like you're marching in place. Uh, I like it at the counter just in case you do have a loss of balance moment. It's safe. Um, Mm -hmm. I also like single leg balance where you're just standing like a flamingo and you can kind of have your hands up like this by the counter so that you can get some good weight bearing through one leg and work on the proprioception through the joints. Um, I also like just little mini squats at the counter where you hold the counter and just kind of sit your butt back and stand back up. So some body weight exercises. People can also do a plank on the counter, holding their arm like in a push-up position um, and just holding steady for a few seconds, getting some weight bearing through their upper body. Um, They can sidestep at the counter. That's one way to also work on your balance um, and working on your lateral movements, though, just sidestepping back and forth at the counter. Um, because one of the things that we've talked about before, Kim, when we, um, have done other bariatric, um, uh, seminars together is just the balance component. I don't know if you want to speak on that or if you want me to. No, I, I please, please go ahead and do so because I do get that question quite a bit, especially after the surgery and everyone's, you know, and where I know we're gonna talk about this a little bit further, but yeah, as the body's changing, as weight loss is coming off, there's other issues, but balance being something that they're trying to relearn, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, I don't know if you remember too, like when we were pregnant where there was some balance things. So it's just really, it's just a change in center of gravity. So the body sets up in the vestibular system um, where your center of gravity is in your brain, but also the joints have proprioceptors that tell you where you are in space. They communicate with the brain back and forth in a really rapid manner. And as this population is losing weight and losing um, center, their center of mass is changing. The joints are trying to figure out where they're at because all of that's changing. So, but the nice thing is the brain can, the brain and the body can communicate and learn very quickly and they will learn even quicker if you give them more to learn with. So that's why I do like, um, some training from weeks two to four, if you're feeling good, that are just basic balance training. Like we just talked about those ones at the counter, sure. another one, um, and just to improve your proprioception, your weight shifting, your change of direction. Those are kind of, um, ways to improve balance. Sure. Another one would be like a four step. So if you have tile on the floor, or even if you don't, if you pick four tiles and you take, um, two steps forward into one to the side, back and to the side and do, you know, one way and then do the other way just to work on change of direction and weight shifting because it's new yeah. and your body will learn it very quick. So mm-hmm. it's different than just walking too, because it's For a sure. change of direction and there's single leg stance moments. And then the last one I would say is if you're out walking and there's a curb, or if you have a two story home or a step into the home is just stepping up and down a single step, working on that single leg moment, that hip flexor moment, that mm-hmm. weight shifting moment. Mm-hmm. And it is a good strengthening aspect for for the um, glutes and the quads and the hamstrings. Yeah, no, that's excellent. And that kind of gets the body kind of moving. And mm-hmm. like you said, you're kind of retraining. You're just kind of, or re- I guess I should say like reintroducing basic, mm-hmm. you know, different movements and different planes. Yeah. I think that's helpful for sure. And then once they get through those initial first four weeks, then what would you start saying, you know, hey, what can we start looking at? And so, yeah, like week six is usually for most surgeries, not just the bariatric population. Um, a kind of um, 
opening week where we're like, okay, we're past all the big healing stuff. Let's see. And if, if everything, there's not a lot of big setbacks or hiccups, then what else can we do? And at this time, I would say that the, the patient or the client could really start thinking about like exercise, like different types, types of cardiovascular exercise, more than just going out on walking and moving for healing and movement aspect. But what can I do now that kind of bumps it up a little bit, turns up the volume a little bit. Um, The cardio that I would recommend is still walking. That's such a great safe cardio. Um, If you are used to the elliptical, um, you could try the elliptical. It's actually, oddly, the elliptical is kind of hard. So um, I would just do five minutes or so on the elliptical and just see, also just see how your knees and your hips handle it. Because it is a little bit of an awkward movement, but the nice thing is there's not a lot of impact. Right. Um, And with the walking, you could up the pace a little bit. So before you, maybe you were just walking to get out and just get some movement, but now let's try and up the pace a little bit. And what we would call zone two, which is where, where you're walking and you're out of breath, but you could still carry a conversation, um, and where you're getting some sweat going. Yeah. Um, I do like swimming. I like walking in the pool. Um, I like a stationary bike, um, I would not probably recommend like pickleball or any sort of sport quite yet just because of the balance component and because they're still losing quite a bit of weight and because we want to work on strength and protect the joints before we do things that are a little bit more dynamic, unless that's something that they were really, really used to before surgery. But a new movement um, that's a dynamic, I wouldn't recommend that quite yet. But that doesn't, that's yet. We'll get there. Yet. Yeah. And I would say too, just because they're so <laughs> early on in their post-op diet progression too, they're that, you know, pickleball are more explosive types of movements, which demand really more carbohydrate intake, um, which they're not doing in these, especially the first several months, yeah. they're really just on protein. So um, that would be pretty fatiguing, I would think, you know, for those types of yeah. movements. So, oh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and at some point we could <laughs> remind the the audience about the time I was trying to run on low carbohydrate and you finally whipped me into shape. <laughs> oh gosh. Oh dear. Listen, I think we've all been there. Yeah. We, I think, right yeah, that was just definitely a phase, but yeah. the carbohydrate, yeah. yeah, for more of the explosive sprinting, you're going to need some carbohydrate. And if, yeah. if at six weeks they're still doing protein, then I would say, yeah, stick with the things that are, are uh, have more oxygen available to you, which would mm-hmm. be walking like in zone two where you can still breathe, you can still talk, but you're going faster where you're sweating and it is, it feels like exertion. Yeah. Um, some people will say if you're talking on the phone, somebody on the other end can hear that you're exercising. That would be like zone two. Gotcha. Um, and, and the point of that would be to help continue to promote weight loss first of all, but also to help. Now we're going to improve our cardiovascular system. We're going to make our heart stronger. Our cardiac output's going to improve. Our capillary beds are going to expand. We're going to get more blood flow to our tissues. Um, And the body accommodates. That's the great thing. Um, Our mitochondrial health will improve, which is going to help our um, metabolism over time Mm -hmm. um, as the weight loss slows. But now your mitochondria are healthier. Um, and, um, which will continue to help with insulin resistance. So it's actually just augmenting the goals that they've already had, um, when they had the the bariatric surgery. Um, and what do you think, like, what do you think about like some low, you know, weights, do you feel like, mm -hmm. you know, at four to six weeks, you know, they've gotten through that phase and they're starting to maybe increase a little bit. Where do you think weights start to come into play? When do you feel like that's a good time? That's a, that's a great question. So I, I would recommend just in general, and of course everybody's different and their pre um, surgery health is different and their pre surgery experience is different. But if, if I had to say overall, I wouldn't recommend weight lifting with weights in the four to six week period. I would rec- recommend it after the six week period, yeah, that definitely. four to six week period, I'd say body weight. So yep. getting your body used to moving with your own body. So mm-hmm. squats, planks, Um, and the things we already talked about, but after six weeks, if they feel good and they feel comfortable, yeah, I would, I would lift weights. Um, the number one thing that we can do, I think for our longevity and our health span is lifting weights. Mm -hmm. And I have been saying that and cardiovascular health is definitely important, but if we don't have a strong structure and our muscle holds a lot of the mitochondria and holds a lot of the blood flow and holds our structure up, weightlifting, um, the research is very clear that it improves our morbidity and mortality by having more skeletal muscle. Um, 
And so at six weeks, if they feel good and they feel up to it and they feel confident and they might have to get help, they might have to find somebody that's a professional and that's totally fine. Mm -hmm. Um, But I would recommend sticking with machines at first, again, depending on their experience with weightlifting, but because it does provide the correct form, the usually the appropriate range of motion, um, you don't have to rack weights. And I've had quite a few patients actually get injured from racking weights. Um, So just sticking, you just move the pin and you just get going with some resistance. Um, A hundred percent lifting weights is important with your population as it is with the entire population. Yeah. And I would just highlight too, I I oftentimes will get, you know, women, um, you know, after surgery, they're like, Hey, I'm just trying to lose weight. Like, why would I want to introduce, you know, weightlifting, you know? So then you kind of get that flip side question, which I know we'll get into here more, but I, I want to encourage specifically female, um, bariatric athletes specifically, mm-hmm. weightlifting is so helpful. And mm-hmm. like you said, if we get through that initial phase when it's when we're cleared to start lifting, um, we start introducing it slowly. It's so helpful for, you know, continuing to change the body composition where we're, you know, losing some body fat, we're increasing uh, muscle mass. And I, I really encourage the women, you know, the research is out there now supporting it. I yeah. mean, it has been, but yeah. it's so important. It's so helpful. And, um, you really just start feeling stronger. I think too, it helps with so many other things that I'm sure you'll touch on, which is injury prevention and range of motion Mm -hmm. and that kind of stuff as you gain muscle, but, um, so important. That's yeah. It's, I get that question a lot too. I mean, and it surprises me sometimes who it comes from too. And a lot of times it's runners. They don't want to have a lot of, um, muscle mass to carry. Um, Mm -hmm. but the runners, that's a whole different uh, conversation, but everybody needs to be strong runners, um, bariatric patients, elderly, everybody has to have skeletal muscle. So weightlifting is the number one tool that we have for that. And that doesn't mean you have to be a crossfitter. That doesn't mean you have to be a power lifter. That means you need to be moving something that's heavier than your body weight over consistently over time. Mm-hmm. Um, and the thing with women not wanting to look bulky or, Um, I mean, we just don't have the hormones for that. So, (laughs) um, and we all have different genetics and different makeup of how our muscle is held on our body. And if eventually you're, if you are at a position where you feel like you have way too much muscle, well, we can dial back, but that doesn't usually, I mean, across the board, that's very few people where all of a sudden you feel like you have too much muscle. Um, and that's actually a really good, healthy place to be. I would rather have too much muscle. (laughs) Right, right, right. No, totally. And would you say then for this, you know, this kind of early post-op phase, then how many days a week would you say would be appropriate for some, you know, lifting using machines or whatever? What would you say? Mm -hmm. At a minimum two, um, you need two days a week of, of doing that. And, and even better would be four. Mm -hmm. Um, so, and again, six weeks, some of your patients might be going back to work and managing families. And I totally get that dynamic, but if, if we're, if we're going to talk ideal four days a week of weightlifting, at least 30 to 45 minutes, um, yeah. and then getting cardio in, um, another, you know, I don't know, hundred minutes a week or yeah. so. Um, because the weightlifting counts a little bit as the cardio, not a ton, but the heart is pumping harder. Um, mm-hmm. but if it's two days a week, then you're going to look at doing a full body program, um, hopefully at least like 50 minutes or so where you're getting, um, you know, your chest and your back and some of your arm muscles, um, a hundred percent, your legs, you need, you have to hit your glutes. Um, glutes are one of our biggest, strongest muscle group. It helps our posture. It helps our walking. Um, and if they want to look up something like posterior chain is kind of the word that's used a lot. And that just helps our posture and our structure be more upright. Um, all of us sit for our jobs. We're on our computers. Um, our eyes are in front. And so a lot of times, you know, whatever we do, whether you're a surgeon, whether you're a um, IT guy, whether you're a truck driver, because our eyes are in front, our bodies tend to kind of move forward. So keeping that posterior chain strong is important for all populations. Um, and then if it's four days a week, you might think about doing, um, two days of upper body and two days of lower body and kind of alternating so that that other muscle group can rest. Love that. Okay. So now let's kind of change gears and we, let's say we're farther down the road. We have a, you Mm -hmm. know, bariatric athlete, they want to optimize, you know, fat loss primarily and really Mm -hmm. increase muscle mass. Um, how would they program for that? Um, specifically, you know, for, I want to start gaining muscle. What would you suggest? Yeah, they would just lean more towards weightlifting in general. So, um, the, uh, the fat loss, like, so you said after six weeks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we're we're past, you know, we're past those initial phases where also I'll just highlight too, because 
as we talk about this, the nutrition side to this is mm -hmm. you have to be taking in enough energy to build muscle. So once we're to a place, yeah, where we can actually do that, then mm -hmm. what types of workouts or how, like, like you're about to say, how many days a week would you say it optimizes muscle gains? Because mm -hmm. I get that question quite a bit. And of course we have to look at their nutrition to see if they can even, they have enough energy to do that. And then the, obviously the stimulus part, which is, you know, to grow muscle, you have to actually move the weight, you know, yeah. um, I would love for you to talk about, you know, what's kind of the recommended amount. Yeah, it, I, I would say if they were going to look at ideal five days a week of weightlifting. Um, and from the energy standpoint, though, maybe you could talk a little bit about um, at what point are they adding in carbohydrates? So yeah. um, the protein needs to be there because weightlifting does break down muscle. Um, and then you have to build it back up with the nutrition and the amino acids. Um, and the body will begin to build that back up as you give it the stimulus over time, but you do have to have the nutrition or it won't build it back up. And right. maybe you could speak about that for a minute. And yeah. I mean, um, obviously as they're progressing and every, everybody's different, you know, with what their mm -hmm. surgeons are telling them and at what point, you know, maybe their center recommends, you know, starting to expand their diet. But typically once we're past three months, we're in a place where we're adding in carbohydrate rich foods and in some places are much mm -hmm. sooner than that. But by three months and beyond, most folks are, you know, most clinics are allowed to or recommending you can start incorporating carbohydrates because the biggest thing that I have to remind my bariatric athletes is with, with muscle gaining, number one, in order to gain muscle, you have to have enough energy intake, right? Mm -hmm. You can be in a very minor um, energy deficit and still gain some muscle. It will slow it down. And, and obviously for the bariatric population, you are in a massive energy deficit, especially the mm -hmm. first, you know, couple years really. And, and ultimately depending upon what your goals are and wh where your, you know, your training is, um, you know, you may always be in a deficit. So, um, we have to look at where, you know, the increase in exercise is also requesting that increase for the nutrition, right? So mm -hmm. usually what I tell my bariatric athletes is once we cross that four to five times a week of an hour or more of whatever the workout is, that's usually where, the three meals a day of just focusing on protein um, is not is definitely not enough. So that's where mm -hmm. we look at, you know, pairing in carbohydrates at every single meal with their protein and then making sure that maybe we add in some snacks as well around the uh, workouts to optimize the training session so that they have enough energy to, to you know, reproduce the movements over and over in their workout. So, um, and then in terms of just gaining itself, we have to look at their overall protein, like you mentioned. And what research has shown, you know, the, the thing that's challenging with with the bariatric population is there's not a ton of research on post-bariatric athletes that are wanting yeah. to gain muscle or endurance or whatever. So that's where we have to kind of utilize the sports nutrition guidelines. And then I'm obviously moving forward. Purpose of this podcast is to bring in experts and hopefully yeah. get more information, you know, for our population. But um, what's been kind of suggested for muscle gain at a minimum is, is about 1.5 gram per kilogram, which is about... 0.7 gram per pound for protein. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And in my previous podcast, I talked to, uh, about how to convert your weight, taking your weight in pounds divided by 2.2, yeah. you get to kilograms, you could multiply that out by 1.5 to get kind of an idea. Now, I also want to hone in on the fact that you don't want to use um, maybe your initial weight from when you just had surgery. You want to use the weight that you get down to that you're going to maintain or what we call more closer to the goal weight. That's the number that you want to use as your weight to calculate your grams mm -hmm. of protein. Protein. And so that higher amount of protein that I just mentioned is what's going to help you to fuel that, um, you know, those workouts so that you can both recover, but also to build. So I know it's a long kind of thing on no, it. No, that's great. Yeah, it's, it's and the protein yeah, intake too. part has, you've seen this kind of progress over time. I've even seen some more current things. Um, some of the people I listen to even higher protein that it's yeah. not going to be hard on the kidneys yeah. and oh, that yeah. some of that has gotten debunked and that totally really, we know that we have to preserve skeletal muscle. Yep. Um, and so, so for your population after three months, if they're working out five days a week, I would say five days a week of weights and yeah. the best way would be to get with a trainer, get with a PT, um, and, get a program going where you can work your big muscle groups where you have the right form. Um, and even if you stay with machines all the way through three, three months or six months, as long as you're progressing your weight over time, um, uh, one of the common errors is people don't want to get hurt. And so they do a lighter weight that feels kind of easy still, even at the end of the set. So make sure if you're doing three sets of 10 of an exercise, which is a good guideline. I know that seems 
old school and not fancy, but it works. It does, it promotes strength and it promotes muscle building. Um, and, um, it's not so low that you're going to be putting too much demand through your joints, especially when we're trying to be joint protective for this population. Um, and, um, so making sure that you are working hard enough. So that's why I like the machines because then you're not, if, if you do fail, then like if, if at, at set at rep number seven, it feels too heavy, then you could just be done. You're not worried about a bar falling on you. Right. Um, and then uh, later as they get more confident with their weight building, maybe get a partner, then maybe they could do more um, Olympic style lifting, but mm-hmm. three sets of 10 um, for upper body, lower body, five days a week, mm-hmm. big muscle groups. Um, it really is that simple. Right. It doesn't yeah. need to yeah. be fancy. And then if they have other goals, like wanting to do pickleball, and we keep saying that because that's kind of a hot topic, yeah. but, um, <laughs> or, or wanting to run or, um, I mean, what are some other goals that you've heard? Yeah, I mean, I I, I just get, you know, hey, I want to go start playing softball again. Softball, or, okay. Yeah, or if um, they have hiking. Hiking, hikes. yeah. If they have sports-specific goals, then on top of the weightlifting and on top of the cardio that they should still be doing some cardio yeah. per week for their cardiovascular health, um, then they can add in some sports-specific things. And it's no different than we tell other athletes, you know, right. like – if, if you're a swimmer, you still need to be uh, a water polo player. You still need to be treading water. You still need to be doing your swim sets. Um, if you're a bariatric athlete that wants to um, climb, hike in Yosemite, then mm-hmm. maybe some of our cardio, we put the treadmill on incline. Um, mm-hmm. Or you do little hikes with a, a pack with weight. Um, yep. And they could look up rucking. Rucking is a great way to get zone to um, cardiovascular endurance and also kind of puts a little bit of stress through their, um, through their low, low back and their hips to help them get stronger. Um, Mm -hmm. and if they want to do running, then I might have them start a little bit jumping so that they're getting some jumping through their ankles and are able to land from, uh, from each step in running. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love that. So, so basically to tie it up. So for strength training, I I, I just want to reiterate this too, because not only is it important for consistency, which I think you and I talk Mm -hmm. about in both of our areas, no matter what your goals are, uh, you know, eating ample protein, um, we'll have to look at calories. We have to look at maybe throwing in extra carbohydrates to help you uh, build muscle. But the consistency with the training is also really important to see gains. Mm -hmm. And I think oftentimes we kind of I'll get clients will say, hey, I just I'm not seeing the gains. I don't understand why. I go, Oh, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. And well, maybe the nutrition's not always dialed in or the exercise is kind of hit or miss. And I, I just wanted to kind of throw that out there because I think that that's such an important piece of this puzzle too, is the consistency piece to all these things. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And we all have um, ways that we hold ourselves accountable. I could, I could tell you mine and maybe you could share some of yours, but for me, if I'm have a goal or if I have a training goal, I, I just use an old school paper calendar yep. um, and I write down what I did when I make a plan ahead of time. And if I did it, then I check it off. And if I didn't do it, then I do a big red X and I don't like to see those X's. Mm-hmm. I have it um, on my bathroom mirror, mm-hmm. um, especially if I'm in a training plan for running. I want to make sure that I have made a goal to myself and a goal to what I want to do. And I'm going to hold myself accountable. Yep. And some, some people might need an another person that helps too, but that sure. writing it down and seeing it day after day does help with that consistency. Sure. Um, and another thing that we didn't touch on earlier, and I wanted to touch on some point today is the wearable technology is mm-hmm. so amazing now yep. for holding yourself accountable, but also for objectivity and for yep. looking back over time. And especially for your population, that's just going to continue to improve in their fitness. If they stay consistent, For sure, they can, you know, get a Garmin or get an Apple Watch or get a Fitbit or do Whoop or um, have an Aura ring and look back over time and go, wow, I used to just post up. I was walking a thousand or 1500 steps a day and now I'm consistently 8,000 steps. And I'm look at, I did my workouts. Um, you know, I did my strength training three times a week. Okay. Then if I'm plateaued, maybe I need to um, do my strength training four times a week. And, and it's just a way that you can self-monitor and self-assess um, yeah. over time. Totally. 
I totally agree with you. I think that that's so important, that feedback, regardless mm-hmm. of where you're getting it from, whether it's the technology, whether it's a journal, whether it's mm-hmm. from friends, your community, um, I think that feedback is so important and it does help because obviously, you know, yes, most of us have the internal motivation to do things, but mm-hmm. guess what? Life happens and we get off track and, uh, or, you know, something happens where you get on the scale and you're like, oh my gosh, because after the surgery, it's it can be frustrating when you start working out and all of a sudden you're like, wait a minute, why did I go up and wait? What the heck's mm-hmm. going on? Um, and so sometimes it's like, I just want to say, forget it. I just want to take this week off, you yeah. know, and that's okay too, you know, take a week off. Yeah, but sometimes, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, I just think that the the consistency piece oftentimes kind of that that needs to be emphasized just because I think it's important with with everything else that you're doing. And and with bariatric clients, we have we've got to take our vitamins. We gotta get in our fluids. Mm-hmm. We gotta, I mean, there's so many things. We have to separate yeah. food and drink and chew 30 times. And I mean, it's it's hard to say consistency because you have to be consistent with so many things. But mm-hmm. definitely if exercise is a goal, I think um, like you're saying, the feedback tools and mechanisms are so helpful yeah. for sure. And and the exercise piece, it, I mean, it should be it absolutely should be a goal, and that's for everybody. That's that's for every human body, and it doesn't need to be like exercise, but some sort of movement because our body is made to move, and movement is medicine. It is the the most holistic way that we can help ourselves. And mm-hmm. I think we um, hear diet and exercise at to where it's annoying to hear those things because it doesn't quite mean anything anymore. And I love what you're doing here because you're really breaking down the nitty gritty of diet and we can do the same thing with exercise. And, and we know that what we put in our body and what we do with our body are the most holistic things that we can do for health over time. And that if you do those things good, you're 90% there. So 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 I think by having some way to, journal, but really I I do love the wearable technology if people can swing it because if you do get stuck, it's a way to really look at yourself in an honest way and not just not go into bad old self-talk where this is never going to work for me or I'm just not good at this or this isn't who I am. It's like you can, if you want to be honest with yourself, you've got this technology, you look back at the calendar and go, oops, I haven't, I've moved once a week for the past four weeks. Um, and it's, 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 it's good. It's yeah. that's something I would really recommend. Yeah, I agree with you. So let's talk. Let's kind of flip this now for my okay. for my bariatric athletes who you know, hey, I want to start doing maybe an endurance training event. Okay, so um, I want to maybe do you know a couch to five k or a ten k or or even more. You know, hey, I want to build up to a half or a full marathon. Um, where do they even like get started? Like what, where do we begin yeah. for that type of goal? And especially for like, let's say running is the goal, like what mm-hmm. for a beginner, you know, where do they begin? Where do they start? Such a good question. I get this from, again, all walks of life too. Like I'll, I could never be a runner. I'm not a runner, um, but I'd love to be a runner. And it's like, we, our bodies were made to run. Anybody, anybody can run. It might take you a couple years to get there, but if you want to, you can get there. Mm-hmm. The first and foremost thing is what, what we already talked about early in the podcast is walking. So getting your feet and your knees and your hips and your back ready, just used to weight bearing and taking steps over time and um, the tissue used to that. Um, So if you are walking pretty pain-free, pretty successfully, and you're walking in zone two a little bit quicker, pretty pain-free successfully for 30, 40 minutes. Um, And then the next thing I would say, and I would say to anybody that's looking into wanting to run is you have to be strong to run. You can't just think that, I mean, the body is made to run, but if you haven't run um, or haven't weight lifted, um, we do need to have strength and key muscle groups to be able to take the impact of running. Yeah. Um, Cause it is harder than walking. It's, it's basically uh, landing from a jump over and over on a single leg. Um, so I would say the next thing, what we've already talked about is getting in the gym and starting lifting some weights for your legs. So like a leg press, a hamstring curl, um, some sideline leg lifts. The, um, if the, if people want to look up gluteus medius strength and hip external rotator strength, um, calf strengthening, your calves have to be really strong, soleus strengthening. So kind of at least a couple months of getting those muscle groups going. Um, and then I love what you already said is couch to 5k is such a good accessible program. It's well-researched. People are very successful with it. They have an app, um, that's a great way. And, and it's basically just interval training where you walk a little bit and then you jog for a little bit and then you walk for a little bit and jog and you just kind of are testing your body. Can I take the impact of, of running? Sure. Um, and, um, as you've done that, then, um, 
I would also say sign up for a race. I, I yeah. forgot to mention that is sign up for something, hold yourself yeah. accountable. Once you've made the goal, make sure you give yourself enough time. Cause we just talked about what you need to get there. Right. But, um, the race event, the race world, the running community is such a great accepting, amazing community. And you will for sure have fun. Yeah. Um, and you'll, you'll feel proud of yourself. So sign up for a race. I would say do sign up for a 5k first. People want to jump into that half marathon distance and that is a beast. Um, but have, so go just take steps. So have that half marathon kind of close to your heart and, um, look for, look for that, um, maybe in the next year. So maybe you do a couple 5ks, again, like I mentioned before, running is so objective. So that's great. You could say, okay, cool. I did, I did a 5k in 60 minutes and now I'm going to try and do it in 40 Mm -hmm. and look at ways to get better at that. Um, other rules for running is I tell people that I don't want them running. If you're very first starting out running, I'd say twice a week, um, just to really give your tissue some time to rest. And you can walk another two times a week where it's just walking and then cross train, other days where you're not weight bearing. So that would usually be the pool or the bike. Sure. Um, and then as you get better than three days a week. So most recreational runners that are newer runners, I don't have them go much more than three days a week. Yeah. Um, that's because doable. the, Oh, totally, totally doable. doable. And that's nobody yeah. really actually wants to run much more than that. Typically. Right. 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 Um, and so, and, and also every other day, don't run if you can, I mean, sometimes schedule change, but in, in general, right. every other day, let your tissue have a break in between yep. where, um, the joints have a break where they're, they're resting. Mm-hmm. Um, and then from a, a, a new runner standpoint, just getting in the right shoe. So go to your local uh, running store. There's a specialty stores um, that can get you fitted in the right shoe. Like locally, we have Fleet Feet. That's a mm-hmm. nationwide company too. And they do a neat assessment on your, your gait and your walk. And for the bariatric um, population, a lot of times I recommend either the Brooks Beast um, because it's it's a nice shoe that's super sturdy that's going to support their ankle, or the Hoka. The Hoka is a newer, newish brand that has newer since I've been running. Um, yeah, great success with that. That is a joint sparing shoe. It has a lot of good cushion. It's a very well built shoe. Oh, good. Um, I would look at those shoes first um, for your population. Perfect. Um, and then get yourself on a program. So say you do sign up for a 5k and you have a timeline, then write it down. Like we mentioned, put it on a calendar and hold yourself accountable. And, um, especially for new runners, do it with friends and family. So that way you have other people to text and celebrate with you. Um, definitely. We got to celebrate. I mean, that's you got to celebrate. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. But I think that's so key. The, the piece of, of committing to a race because regardless of what it is. And then I want to also mention, I, I was thinking about when we, when we first met, um, I mm-hmm. was actually doing a, a training program that we had for yeah. our clients at the wellness uh, company. And um, yeah. we started during the, ha- it was a half marathon training program. Mm-hmm. And um, we ran as a group, I think it was two short runs and then like a longer run as we were mm-hmm. building up for um, yes. the, the longer, of course, this was a half marathon. So, um, and then, you know, the cross training, but the key piece that I thought was helpful was we gave ourselves six months. And then also in that training program, we did, we encouraged our members to go to 5Ks and 10Ks also just to kind of get yes. the experience of the smaller mm-hmm. distances earlier on and then building. Mm-hmm. So I think it's so key to emphasize like, yeah, start small and then you can continue to build as you you know move forward. Yeah, it is. It's a common thing. People just jump right into the half marathon because it is, it feels like a big goal and it is. Um, but I always like people to have those little successes at first where they feel like, okay, I really did this. I did great. And then also when you do a single event, then you can, you can rework what worked and what didn't versus going for the big, big gun and then maybe not feeling as successful and not knowing where it went wrong. So I definitely encourage a brand new runner 5k for the first one. Um, And I remember back in those days when you were doing that program, that was when I was kind of getting better and trying to get faster with running. I just want to give you props from those days. And that's how we, that's really when I kind of was like, all right, this girl knows her stuff is I, I really pushed the um, body and fitness piece because that's my niche. And I kind of ignored the nutrition piece. (laughs) And I remember after a half marathon, I'll just give the people the story. I, 
um, here, the local one, there's a hill on mile nine that's pretty long and pretty decent. And I totally, I, my, I was going for a PR. I was going pretty quick and that hill just totally bonked me. I hit the yeah. brakes. My body hit the brakes mile nine. And I, I really kind of slugged up the rest of the hill until there was a goo station at the top. And I took a goo and then it felt like I, I kind of rejuvenated and then back to my pace. But I lost about four minutes because of that. Um, and you really helped me afterwards realize like we broke it down and what happened on that hill. And you kind of told me, you know, metabolically what happened and what I didn't do ahead of time. And I'll say all of the stuff that you told me to do before races now, it has worked every single time. I mean, your pre-race nutrition program works for me. So I will tell your audience, she knows her stuff. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. No, I mean, it's, but that's the, the, it's so different. And then of course for a bariatric athlete too, it's Mm -hmm. so different because with their new anatomy, it's harder Mm -hmm. to tolerate a lot of those products. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, the sports nutrition products are too concentrated in carbohydrate Mm -hmm. for a lot of, especially if it's a bypass or duodenal switch patient, my sleeve patients are kind of can go both ways. Um, But just dialing in. And as I was going to mention, as you build up from a 5k to a 10k, that's where nutrition is even more so important in those races, because you can't just go out and run, you know, 13.1 miles on water, you know, you no. do have to emphasize or even on breakfast. Yeah, exactly. Nope. Just having your one meal, like I'm just going to yeah. do this, you know, but, um, and just really practicing that throughout the training program mm-hmm. and, and finding what you tolerate. And as a bariatric athlete knows, you know, some days they may tolerate something and some days mm-hmm. they may not. And, you know, that could be for any athlete, but it's even more, you know, even of more. something to deal with, you know, to figure out, you know, what works. So yeah. That's, and that's you a, do have to piece. practice your nutrition. If we're talking about your athletes getting into running, um, you have to practice your nutrition because sure. there's some things even as a non-bariatric athlete that your stomach won't tolerate. And you, sure. you have always told me, do not try anything new on race day. Yes. Um, yes. and, uh, I did that actually at the Boston marathon. Um, and I, I remember I called you before I left because I had just had COVID before the Boston marathon. And then I lost a bunch of weight and I did have GI stuff because of the COVID. I didn't never got a respiratory, which was lucky for me. I could still participate, but it have some GI stuff was trying to figure out how to put some weight back on, even with my tummy being sour. And during the Boston marathon, dumbly, I took a block chew, um, which I've never taken. I always have done goose. I took it on the course. The course provided it. I have no idea why I did that. And (laughs) um, mile 16, I think it was, my tummy just seized up. And that was what that was going to be for a while um, for the rest of the race. Just a huge stomach cramp that slowed me down. But um, so for your athletes, just want to reemphasize you do out of practice your nutrition. If you get up into that half marathon, um, 10 K even, um, or marathon, uh, Mm -hmm. length, when you do your longer runs, you do want to practice what works for you. Um, and so that, you know, for race day, because even, even non-bariatric athletes, some of my friends this weekend on the marathon, they experience significant nausea for reasons that they don't know. Yeah. Yeah. And some of that can be due to dehydration. Some of that Mm -hmm. can be due to eating or drinking too much at one time or not spacing Mm -hmm. it. I mean, the recommendation typically for if you're going to be exercising consistently longer than an hour, it's 30 to 60 grams of carbohydrate uh, per hour. So Mm -hmm. what I have my bariatric athletes do, they can't eat 30 grams at one time. Um, That's not Mm going to happen. So what bariatric athletes seem to do well with is about 10 grams each time. Mm -hmm. But of course, they have to be more consistent and persistent with that fueling strategy because they can't just oh yeah, I have to get 30 to 60 grams and let me just do this entire gel or goo. Some people can um, Mm -hmm. and some can't. Um, And so uh, what we have to figure out is you know, the amount that you can tolerate, we strategize with timing, we're, you know, separating food and drink. Um, Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a lot, but like you said, it's, it's the practicing part that is most important to your, you know, to your race day. And and let me just say too, um, to add on to your story, uh, I think it was the last half marathon I did was the one here. And I don't know if you remember this, but Michelob Ultra was a sponsor of the race. And they had it on the course. (laughs) Sure did. Yeah. So let me just, yeah. So at mile, I think it was mile 11 of 13 miles. I was like, there's a can of beer. I'm going to have one. Let me just do that. Cause you know, I always drink beer on a course. Never. Of course. And let's do it. So I did it. And, um, Literally, I only had two miles to go, and I was like, I'm gonna drink this, you know, cup. And 
started having you know stomach bubbles yeah. the carbonation was not my friend yeah. and literally for the last you know mile and a half i was in a world of hurt crossed mm-hmm. the finish line immediately had to go to the porta potty had oh, major dear. gi distress and um <laughs> couldn't even enjoy like the the post race breakfast area but yeah I, oh yeah. i was not eating there was no more no. breakfast like yeah yeah it was done and just from this much of a little mm-hmm. cup of beer, you know, that I yeah. never do on race day. Right. So yeah, lessons learned. <laughs> and I think the harder, like the harder you're pushing yourself, then the more, um, the more dialed in you need to be. Like if yeah. you're walking a race, like you can have a beer, you know, to, yeah. if your yeah. body's used to a beer, sure. but if, if you're like racing a race, then you've got to be dialed in because like you, that tummy will turn on you because the, the yeah. blood flow is, you know, as you tell your people, it's shunting to the muscles. The, yep. the tummy doesn't have a lot going for it. Right. Um, yeah, so race day nutrition, um, and I, I don't want to overwhelm people or, you know, you will get there. And it, it, I think as runners, it's sort of kind of part of the fun of it. If we could call it that it's because you are really pushing your body, which you have earned it. You have done the training and you kind of see, did I hit every piece of the pie? Did I, did I do enough strength training? Are my calves going to seize up? Are they maybe not as strong as they could be? Did I hydrate enough? Are my, am I going to get muscle cramps? Do I have enough, um, um, electrolytes? Uh, did I do enough, of course, the running training? Did I do enough speed work? Did I um, do enough hill work? And that's really, if you're trying to dial in and get get better, um, as you get more experienced. And so every piece of the pie. And to me, that is really the fun of it because we've been given these bodies. They are a gift. They are all on a journey. And if, if you want to see what it can do, you've got to test it. And, and kind of like that meme, it's like, but did you die? Like, you're not going to hopefully won't, you know what I mean? But after, afterwards you go, whoops, this or this didn't work. And you regroup and hopefully, you know, you have been one of my best sounding boards over the years for that is like this or this didn't work or it, maybe this did work. Um, and so I, I just, I think that's fun. I mean, I don't know if I'm a dork, but like, I think that is a great way to live in these bodies, honestly. And, and even for your population, they've been through a journey, they've done a big thing and they're working towards health and fitness goals. See what you got, you know, like, and just be honest with yourself and get, get a partner like Kim or get a partner like, you know, a PT or um, even a family member and, and see what you can get. Yeah, no, I totally agree with you. I think that's such good advice because it's, it, it's such a huge decision to go through this process and have bariatric mm-hmm. surgery. And then, Hey, by the way, I'm also going to start doing, you know, yeah. whatever that cool new goal is. And yeah, you need that. Um, for me, external motivation, I should say that, mm-hmm. Hey, I want to do this thing and yeah. whatever happens, happens. I'm going to go for it. And, you know, put it all out on the table, so to speak. And and then when yeah. if things work great, great. Learn from it. Move it on to the next thing. If it doesn't work great, what happened? You know, what can we do to fix that? And, and that's what's great about, you know, nutrition and, and training is things mm-hmm. can be changed, right? So and, yeah, I'd like to, thing. you know, as you said, like that external motivation. So if we just like raise above all of this, you know, protein and yeah. strength and three sets of 10, if we raise way Obviously. above and go like, well, what, what are we doing here? What are we doing with this life? You right. know, we, we right. got to do things that are fun and that are exciting and that make, if you think of something, maybe it's not running. If you right. think of something that lights your spirit up, maybe totally. it's um, climbing half dome or maybe it's uh, being able to walk the Camino or maybe, and that lights your spirit up. Like that's what we're meant to do. And most so of the true. time they're, there's a physical component to it. And so why do we go to the gym four to five times a week? Um, it's not because we want to be at the gym four to five times a week. It's because we want our bodies to feel good and be healthy and to experience new and different things that make our spirit excited, our insides excited. Um, and like for me with, with running, like, I mean, I don't necessarily love the act of running, but I do love the race environment. I think it's fun. I love the community. I love that it's a goal that's tangible that I can measure myself on. Mm -hmm. And then because I have the ability to run in that sort of distance, I can say, hey, I'm going to go just on a whim, go walk the Camino and walk 100 miles through Europe. Um, And that's not, that should, because we have bodies that that are able to do that. Um, Yeah, for sure. So. I, I do. I, whenever I'm helping people with wellness goals, I always say, 
every six months you need to have a stretch goal. That's an activity that excites you. And that's a little bit scary. Like, you know, it should be a little bit scary because then it pushes yourself. No. And I think that's, that's such a good advice in terms of having a stretch goal, because I think Mm -hmm. that kind of keeps our eyes, like you said, kind of down the road and not just so focused Mm -hmm. on, oh my gosh, today I didn't feel good in this workout. Yeah. And the whole Mm -hmm. thing is off the table. No, it's not. It's one bad day. We get back on the, you know, stick tomorrow and we, and we keep, we keep at it, you know? Just yeah. Like it's hundred percent cumulative. Like I've learned that so much with running is I will have a bad run. I feel bad. I'm uh, and then, you know, a day later, then two days later after I've rested and maybe probably it's usually sleep for me and I've slept better. And then it's like, Oh wow, I killed that run, you know? Um, and the, the other kind of practice that I do that I'd like to share with your people is each time you finish a, a workout, do some sort of practice that kind of gives gratitude back to your body. So mm-hmm. when I, I do a lot of my runs on the treadmill, when I finish on the treadmill, I usually kind of hit my heart and hit my legs and say, thank you. And so I think that's a good way to give yourself and your body just gratitude for what it is, because mm-hmm. Even though our our patients and our clients have been through hardships and been through hard times with their bodies, whether it was an accident or total knee replacement or bariatric patient, um, the the body really is good. It really serves us. And there are a thousand things a day and a minute that it's doing positive for you. And so if we could remember that and kind of re-put that gratitude back to ourselves, I think that also is cumulative. Yeah, I agree with you so much. Um, I, I think that that's such an important piece too, especially like you said, it's the cumulative aspect of all of these things w- w- with the weight loss journey that we're on, with these new routines we're doing, but also give yourself some grace consistently mm-hmm. too, right? Because mm-hmm. it's so, um, there's so many challenges and I I just want to say, you're doing awesome. I mean, like yeah. when I have, I have these clients that are doing amazing things. They literally lost 100, 200 pounds. I mean, and they're running marathons and they're like upset yeah. because, you know, hey, I didn't do my best time. It's like, oh my gosh, you just ran a marathon. There's people that, uh-huh. people that don't have had bariatric surgery that aren't yeah, even yeah. close to that. So yep. I just think- Welcome giving, to the world of runners. Yes. yes giving <laughs> yourself- <laughs> That yeah. is a runner for you. <laughs> yeah. But giving yourself <laughs> grace. I mean, honestly, it's it's so true. And it's such an important piece to this journey is, yeah. is just that self- love. And um, yeah, I know. I think it's an important piece too. And yeah. anyways, I, I know we kind of got going down different thing. I wanted right. to ask you um, too, this is just a question I always get. Uh, I have, ha- I'm having a lot of joint pain and mm-hmm. um, I, I lost weight. I'm all of a sudden having this pain. Like, what do you think this is? Why is this happening? I thought I'd feel better. Can you kind of mm-hmm. talk about what you think contributes to like the joint pain or just having some overall achiness after surgery mm-hmm. as they're losing weight? Yeah. So a couple things there is if they've increased their activity and they're having a specific joint pain, like say their right hip or their, you know, right low back, um, they would maybe want to test that, that joint and kind of maybe just move it, maybe bring their knee to their chest and see, is the hip feeling sharp? Um, and maybe then they would want to reach out to their doctor and see if there's something going on in that joint. But if it's generalized across the board, body joint, achiness, Mm -hmm. then that's different. That's more probably like a uh, metabolic um, process that's happening because of the catabolism that's happening in their body with the weight loss. Um, It's probably a little bit inflammatory. So the joints do hold a lot of inflammation. And then back to that proprioception component where because their center of gravity is different and because their joints are learning new positions of their body, um, the joints might just not quite know where they are in space and are just feeling it a little bit more because they're, the muscles and the tendons and the tissue is working harder. Mm-hmm. Um, what I've read in the research is it tends to be transient. So it kind of comes on as activity increases and usually around the four to six week period when you are starting to walk more. Mm-hmm. So if you could wait it out, if you don't feel like it's a specific injury, mm-hmm. um, Um, and do all of the things that we would recommend where you maybe support the joints. Usually it's the knees and the ankles. So if it does feel like it's heavy in your knees, you could grab just some over the counter, like neoprene braces and put them over your knees and just kind of support and give the joint a little bit of a hug. Mm -hmm. I don't recommend that long-term over time because I don't want your joint to get used to that. I want your muscles to do the work. Um, I love KT tape. I use it a ton. So you could, you know, reach out to me or YouTube some videos on how to support a certain joint with the KT tape. And what that does is it just improves proprioceptive awareness through the joint because the tape is on the joint and does give a little bit of support there. It's, it's highly elastic that tape. Sure. Um, And then the other thing I would say is um, just improving your overall kinesthetic awareness of where you're at in space because the joints, again, are trying to learn where to be. Mm -hmm. An activity you could do is in the morning when you wake up, 
after you've stood and kind of got your ground is like go up against a wall and just press tight against the wall and kind of bring your neck back against the wall and squeeze your blades, squeeze your tummy, squeeze your butt, squeeze your thighs, kind of squeeze your calves, do 10 or 15 of those, um, mm-hmm. uh, you know, just to kind of improve awareness of your body and space. And the wall gives a little bit of an awareness too, and it also promotes good posture. Um, so I don't know from a diet standpoint, if, if you have any thoughts on the pain, but the, from just a joint and muscle standpoint, those are, those are my thoughts. Yeah, no, I would just say the only thing that I would, I would think of is when they say that is, you know, it, are a couple things like, are they dehydrated? Are they not recovering mm-hmm. well from their workouts? Mm-hmm. Are they training too much? Did they not train enough and then try something new and, and you know, and it caused mm-hmm. something to, you know, yeah. Be strained. So I think uh, like what I get more questions is just kind of this general feeling of like joint pain and thing. And like you mentioned, mm-hmm. if it's not like a sharp pain or like where we introduced some type of inflammation yeah. to that specific area because of something we did, um, I-, I have heard the same thing. It usually goes away, but I didn't know. I just yeah. I'm always just like, oh, are you eating while well? you're drinking? This isn't my area of expertise. This isn't Let me my- get you- yeah. And I'll, yeah. I'll say like, um, this isn't quite the topic of this podcast, but just to say quickly is sometimes high loads of sugar, if maybe they did go to a birthday party and have cake or alcohol. And I know that yeah. they're not advised on neither of those early, but hold them, hold yourself accountable if you did have those things. And then you felt a lot of joint pain the next day. I've seen that in my population oh, at the clinic, um, point. alcohol, especially it's inflammatory. Um, and that's kind of a bummer, but it is. Um, I know this one guy specifically, I was working on his ankle and it was, it was swelling. We were working a ton to get the swelling down. Swelling was down. And then, you know, football season, Super Bowl comes after Super Bowl and it's all swollen again. He didn't do anything different, but it was just the alcohol. We oh. determined it. So just kind of also noting those things. Are you different eating? Mm-hmm. Did you happen to eat something that's highly inflammatory? Yeah. For sure. So having worked with so many people recovering from big injuries, surgeries, mm-hmm. things like that, are there any other pieces of wisdom um, that you can offer to the uh, bariatric population? Yeah. Um, just know that it's a journey. It's a longer journey. And we've already talked about the cumulative a- aspect of that, but trust your body and trust the process. So this is something, this is not a new surgery. This is something that people have done um, many, many, many of, and have been very successful at. Um, listen to your body and try to be honest with yourself about what's going on. And that that comes along with the documenting and maybe the wearable Um, Be good to yourself, be gracious to yourself, give yourself credit, um, and then seek accountability with um, friends or family if you need to. Um, And then the the biggest piece is uh, just consistency, and and consistency can be boring. Um, It doesn't need to be fancy, Uh, just be consistent. And the exciting part would be just signing up for some of those events or activities that make you excited that your body can do. I love it. I love it. Thank you so much. I appreciate all of your words of wisdom today and just sharing your time and expertise because I can tell you guys, I've personally worked with Sarah also, and um, she is so helpful, so knowledgeable. Um, And here's me texting her like, oh my gosh, I pulled my hamstring on the treadmill (laughs) launch theory, you know, help. And I just have so appreciated all of your help also. And I just wanted to make sure that you know how appreciative I am because seriously, you're you're a gem and you're so helpful. And I, I want to let our audience know, can you share kind of where people can find you, where they can find out more about your services and how to contact you? Okay. Yeah. Um, my Instagram, I have two, it's, um, at DR Sarah with an H Anderson PT is, um, just kind of my PT Instagram. And then I have, um, at continuum PT underscore wellness on Instagram. Um, and then my email is Sarah at continuum physical therapy.com. Sarah awesome. with an H. Yeah. Awesome. And I'll put those in the show notes too. That way people okay. can go ahead and just click right on those. So thank you again. I so much You're appreciate welcome. you coming today. And um, guys, we just want to remind you, uh, obviously you can uh, find this particular podcast now on YouTube. You can watch this in a video format, which is great. Um, Active Bariatric Nutrition. You can find me on Instagram, on TikTok, Facebook, all the things, right? And if you want to learn more about my one-to-one bariatric nutrition coaching services, you can go to my website, www.activebariatricnutrition.com. And um, just if you don't mind sharing this with folks, we just want to get this information out because like we said earlier, you know, there's not a lot of talk for bariatric athletes in terms of what to do, what to eat, what to do for exercise. And I think that this episode particularly is is so helpful. And, and thanks to Dr. Sarah Anderson. We just appreciate your time today. Thanks so much. 
You're welcome. All right. And guys, I will see you again next week. Have a great day. Take care.